Last week in Michigan politics says the presidential and statewide campaigns continue to dominate the headlines down ballot races, including the race for the state's second largest city's mayor are in full swing. We take you through the latest from election season here in Michigan. Plus, everywhere you look, concerns and questions around the elections process are continuing to swirl. We walk you through the process and things you need to know if you prepare to go to the polls. I'm Josh Albertus, and this is your 13 on your side rundown. And we begin with the race for the White House that continues to run right through West Michigan. On Friday, former President Donald Trump in Traverse City before heading to Novi. Often we've heard Trump home in on the advantage his candidacy has had in recent polls on top issues like the economy and immigration. But Trump also leaning into what will likely be one of his final parting messages to voters in this key battleground, focusing on the contrast he feels exists between himself and his Democratic opponent. We have to bury the hatred and the lies and the avalanche, and we have to do it in an avalanche of votes. And every time you see a spear, every time you hear them attack, take the motivation to go out and vote, vote, vote. With your help, 11 days from now, we're going to win Michigan, we're going to defeat Kamala Harris, and we're going to make America great again. Also this weekend, Vice President Kamala Harris returning to West Michigan just about one week after coming to Grand Rapids. And this time, she brought a former occupant of the White House along with her. Former First Lady Michelle Obama appearing with Harris on stage as the Democratic candidate also seeks to make her final lasting impressions on swing state voters. And everybody here knows this is going to be a tight race till the very end. So we have a lot of work to do. But we like hard work. Hard work is good work. Hard work is joyful work. And make no mistake, we will win. Harris is also expected to rally with her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz in Ann Arbor on Monday, as the candidates continue to close out election season and wait for what the voters will decide. But as for this weekend's rallies, you can watch the full speeches from both Harris and Trump up on our website, 13onyourside.com. Also making headlines this week, former Republican Congressman Fred Upton publicly endorsing Democratic presidential nominee Harris. He made this announcement during a virtual press call Thursday morning, and this particular endorsement might hold more for some people in this key region, given just how long Upton was in his seat in southwest Michigan. But the Trump campaign is saying it's not worth listening to. Upton served in Congress for almost 40 years from the late 80s until retiring in 2023. Thursday, Upton was joined by Michigan Republicans for Harris Waltz co-chair and former Congressman Dave Trott. They say the goal of the event was to call on fellow Republicans to back Vice President Harris. Upton saying he's never voted for a Democrat for president before, but has already cast his vote for Harris. I've never before voted for a Democrat for president, and I honestly never thought I would. But she's strong, committed public servant. She's running to put people together strengthen our economy and protect our fundamental freedoms. We certainly don't agree on every policy, that's for sure. But I know that Harris has the best interests of the American people at heart. And in response to Upton's endorsement, a Trump campaign spokesperson telling us, quote, Michigan families are worried about paying their bills, putting food on the table, and saving for their kids' college tuition. Any Republican campaigning for another four years of unfettered illegal immigration and rising prices under Kamala Harris is neither Republican nor worth listening to. Candidates for Grand Rapids Mayor Sunita Lanier and David Legrand debated this week in front of an audience at the Wealthy Theater. 13 on your side's Julia Gorman was there and has a look at some of the big topics discussed. The candidates were asked about transportation, housing, parking, student absenteeism, people who are unhoused, crime, and more. At the end of formal questions, people in the crowd could ask their own questions as well. <laughs> Just two weeks out from Election Day, candidates for Grand Rapids Mayor Sunita Lanier and David Legrand debated in front of dozens inside the Wealthy Theater. 
Formal questions stemmed from a community survey, like how to improve transportation to support equity throughout neighborhoods. I do believe that one of the solutions really is um, um, diversifying our modes of transportation. I think that we should look at shuttles that shuttle people from within neighborhood business districts downtown and the people who are downtown into the neighborhood business districts. This whole conversation really comes down to uh, wealth building in the community among the people who have the least amount of money. I'm excited by the idea of actually moving us a lot further forward on making Grand Rapids cycling friendly and pedestrian friendly. The two were asked about how the city should help unhoused people living on the streets. We're underspending uh, and that's partly because we're not willing to articulate the reality, which is about 80% of the money we spend with, to help the unhoused, has to be spent on programming. It has to be spent on support services. Nonprofit accountability. In Grand Rapids, we are program rich and impact poor. And so there's something broken in the systems that we have in place to address some of these issues. Later on, they answered how the city should more effectively cut down on violent crime while building trust and confidence in policing. To this day, I'm still a part of is the Safe Alliances for Everyone task force. It's made up of um, the police department as well as the prosecutor's office and then grassroots nonprofit and nonprofit organizations as well as commissioners all sitting at the table to find solutions to address violent acts. Um, there are lots of ways in which we can better triage and uh, better respond to incidents that don't always involve an armed violent response, and that's uh, something we really need to work on. And there was so much more discussed in the debate to watch more of it. We have a link up in this story on our website. In the newsroom, I'm Julia Gorman, 13 on your side. Something to be on the lookout for this election season is the use of artificial intelligence. To check a picture you think might be created with AI, experts suggest a reverse image search. Screenshot the picture and upload it to images.google.com. There you can see all the sites the picture has been used and where it was originally posted. In AI images, keep in mind people or objects in the photo may also be distorted, like the wrong number of fingers and hands blending into other objects in the picture. But experts say as AI becomes more sophisticated, these things are becoming harder to identify. So some of the, the ways that we would use a year ago are no longer valid. And actually some of the ways we would use six months ago even more recent or no longer valid because these tools come out so quickly. When it comes to identifying AI in video, he says to look and see if the lips match what the words are and that the audio lines up. For AI generated voices, you should listen for distorted background noises and for words that do not make sense in the context of what's being said. There's a lot of questions surrounding the processes around the upcoming election. So coming up, we'll break down what you need to know when you head to the polls on election day or throughout the early voting period. With election day quickly approaching, spreading confidence in the system is a top priority for officials across our battleground state. We spent a morning this week with one local county clerk who showed us a hands on experience of what happens on election night and what safeguards are in place. It was in this room in early 2016 when Ottawa County Clerk Justin Roebuck remembers being faced with an unexpected narrative. I remember getting questions from the folks who were in the room about whether or not they could trust that the vote was going to be counted accurately. It's skepticism he says has now been fomenting for years. It's so important for us as election administrators to be transparent about what we're doing um, and for voters to be able to ask questions and get answers and see the process um, play out for themselves. So ahead of the election, Roebuck took me through everything a voter needs to know to cast a ballot, including the requirements surrounding photo ID for in-person voting. And what I can actually do is scan that ID and it will pre-populate in the poll book your voter information. But for some, the concerns come from what may happen after the polls close. But as Roebuck showed us, it's a system filled with checks, balances. There always has to be representation from both major political parties in the precinct. And even metal cages. They are checking the seal number on this uh, cage device and making sure that nothing's been tampered with overnight. But what about the ballots? They're actually gonna break a seal that is on this uh, uh, door here and they're going to remove the voted ballots from 
uh, this box essentially where the tabulator goes. So the voted ballots are sealed in uh, an approved ballot container, and this is an example of one here. And as to whether the machines could be tampered with. There's a state seal that's placed on here, and that seal is placed on the equipment during the public logic and accuracy testing for the equipment. So that seal number has to be verified. It's kept in multiple places. As the seal is broken, um, bipartisan teams are watching that process. It's recorded. Basically, workers would be able to physically see if the memory of a machine was tampered with in between official processes. Even the passwords that are required to close the polls, uh, there would be a different set of passwords and a different authentication to clear the totals from this equipment. But even with these in place, concerns have continued to swirl. And as the person who's in charge of all of this, who's doing the work day in and day out, and is saying as much as he can about the, the security of the process, how does that feel to you when we get so much skepticism over the elections these days? I mean, I think over the past several years, we've seen a growing body of misinformation affecting our communities. And what we want to show through our work is the transparency, the bipartisanship that is involved in this process, the complete openness to the public as far as what is happening here. And it's so important that our public sees uh, those steps that go into the process so that they can trust the process by which they're choosing their government. Early voting in Michigan is officially underway across the state as of Saturday. We break down some of what you need to know if you plan to vote early between now and next Sunday. So many people in West Michigan are focused on their everyday lives, and while they may be determined to vote, they might not be able to get to their voting site on Election Day. Of course, absentee voting has been open for a while now, but for many others, early voting may be the way to go. Since early voting is fairly new, we're going over some of the things you should know before casting your ballot. First off, confirm your early voting location. Your polling place on Election Day may not be the same you'll vote in if you instead choose to vote early in person. In places like Ottawa County, voters from multiple precincts will vote together in one location. Not sure where that is? Just go to the Secretary of State's website, put in your address where you're registered to vote, and it will tell you where your early site is. Also, you may be wondering if anything's different from Election Day. For the voter, it'll look pretty much the same, but from a security standpoint, it may be different behind the scenes to make sure no one's tampering with anything overnight. As the Ottawa County Clerk explained to us earlier this week when he took us through a mock early voting site, there they actually will have metal cages containing the materials that will provide security. And this whole thing is wheeled into a secured locked room. We're under video surveillance 24-7 in that room. And then the following morning when the crew arrives to get everything out, they are checking the seal number on this uh, cage device and making sure that nothing's been tampered with overnight. Also, some may wonder if you can still vote early instead if you already requested an absentee ballot. Good news is you can while still only voting once. You can do that by bringing your absentee ballot to the early voting site and surrendering it to the workers. It can't be counted and you will still only vote once with your new in-person ballot. So a lot to keep in mind and a lot more on the whole process can be found at the election guide on our website 13onyourside.com. Michigan's voter rolls and registration have gotten national attention this week after ex-owner Elon Musk reposted a claim that the state has 100,000 more registered voters than eligible citizens, criticizing Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Benson calling that post dangerous information, quote, then clarifying that over 1 million of those registered voters are inactive and are slated for removal. Muskegon County's clerk tells us the issue with looking at the voter rolls is that it's always changing. It may have 178,000 people on it um, at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then you look again at 11, and it, the numbers change because it's a fluid. People are moving. People are, the clerks from around the state are um, uh, sending in death certificates, sending in moving. Um, information. So it, it's fluid. It, the numbers are never the same. 
According to Michigan law, a voter cannot be taken off the voter roll until they are inactive for two even eared federal election cycles or four years. Also regarding Michigan's voter rolls, two election related lawsuits in Michigan filed by the Republican National Committee were thrown out by federal judges last week. One of the lawsuits alleged that Michigan had more registered voters than eligible citizens. A federal judge, however, said the RNC did not show any specific case of an ineligible voter on the state's active voter list. The second lawsuit targeted the process surrounding spouses of military voters and voters born overseas that had parents who were residents of the state. A federal judge dismissed that case due to a late filing, but according to the AP, added that the election language complied with state and federal law. One West Michigan organization is ready to make casting a ballot on Election Day more accessible. Next, we take a look at an Election Day transportation resource for people in wheelchairs that costs a lot less than you may think. Michiganders have an updated tool to track absentee and early voting in the state. The Secretary of State's office launched the new Michigan Voters Dashboard last week. The dashboard displays active registered voters and their turnout so far via absentee and early voting. You can also see the number of absentee ballots requested and returned on the state level, county level, and even down to the municipality. You can find a link to the dashboard at 13onyourside.com. For the first time ever in a presidential election, you'll be able to track that ballot here in Michigan. The state passed a law a few years ago that requires it. To track your ballot, go to michigan.gov vote, click on the absentee voting tab, and then the tab, did my ballot arrive? Enter your information to see updates. Those updates start when your application is submitted to your clerk. You can see when your ballot was mailed, received, and whether it was accepted or rejected. If rejected, you'll get the reason and instructions to fix it. You can get updates in several different ways. Getting to the polls on Election Day is a worry for many voters with disabilities. But there is an option for people in wheelchairs to rent a ride for a very reasonable price. 13 on your side's Julia Gorman has the story. David Covey is a plant lover, antique collector, and travel buff. I do enjoy plants. He also uses a wheelchair at times to get around. It depends on what I need. Which can be challenging for several reasons. I think primarily transportation is a number one issue. Take, for example, getting to the polls on Election Day. <laughs> So learning about the Roll to the Polls initiative offered by the Creative Mobility Group was welcome news. And it's really an effort just to remove uh, barriers for wheelchair users. We are offering uh, $1 wheelchair accessible van rentals on Election Day. For that transportation, that's outstanding. David explains getting to the polls or the store or a friend's house can require extra time and planning. It's a really, really uh, challenging to make these arrangements and so uh, that need to be so detailed for many people and instead of just to whip in with their car and choose to vote whenever they whenever they would choose. It's also challenging due to cost, need for equipment or weather. It's a great uh, to offering to uh, squash the whole notion that uh, well I don't have the option to vote uh, I don't have the res I don't have the transportation to go he wants to spread the word so people of all abilities make it to their voting place if you don't like it vote you know and don't complain just vote you know yeah we have to vote it's yet another challenge but when he's motivated to take on to help others reap the benefits and you can rent a wheelchair accessible vehicle for $1 for a period of four hours on Election Day through the Creative Mobility Group. We have information on how to sign up in this story on our website. And with election season in full swing, things happening in state politics may go under the radar. But up next, we look at some of the latest out of the state government, including a new program aimed at expanding access to contraception. Starting next month, free contraception supplies will be available to Michigan families. Governor Gretchen Whitmer made the announcement this past week. 
The Take Control of Your Birth Control program will offer free over-the-counter birth control pills, condoms, over-the-counter emergency contraception, and family planning educational resources. The state's chief medical executive says this is important because it provides the public with necessary resources and education on contraceptions and family planning. Starting in November, go to michigan.gov slash take control to see a list of participating organizations across the state. And while elections are topping the headlines these days, state politics are still very much in swing. And here in Michigan, the state's Housing Development Authority announced a new first-time homebuyer program that could reduce your mortgage interest rate by one full percentage point. The Housing Authority partnered with the Federal Home Loan Bank of Indianapolis to offer the program to eligible buyers in our state. It's called the Rate Relief Mortgage, and in order to qualify, you must have income at or below 80% of the area median income and have a credit score above 640. The program also requires that the home's cost not exceed $224,500. You can find a list of participating lenders in the program and what the area median income for where you live is at 13onyourside.com. And that's the rundown for your week in Michigan politics. Be sure to keep up with all the top political stories of the day, both on air and online at 13onyourside.com. We'll see you next week.